Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I do want to thank uh, Susanna Stewart and you, Peter, for this event. Because, uh, in my opinion, it is an important event, an important event, uh, an important commemoration and also a preparation for future works on Bernard. And I hope this will help to introduce Bernard's work yeah. in the university, university, university uh, studies uh, as uh, we have uh, succeeded to do with uh, Simon Don's work. So, I hope that my brief talk will, will help you to, to better understand uh, the nature of my critical dialogue with Bernard during the 20 years that I have been with him. Of course, the book that I will devote to him in parallel to my future Critique de la Raison Désirante will leave much less room for critical dialogue, since it will first be a question of explaining his thought, his, his thought by producing an exegesis, as I, I like them. Today, it did not seem relevant to me to sketch anything in terms of exegesis, and in such a short time. In my, in my memorial au confluent du désir et de l'humain, I recalled how my meeting with Bernard in 1995 uh, was absolutely not the meeting between a future master and a future disciple, but the meeting between a 43 years old philosopher who was beginning to build his work and a young 28 years old teacher of philosophy whose great youth philosophical project was put on hold for years and was not to begin to be built until 20, 2015, after all the prior work of controversial exegesis of Simondo's work over a period of 20 years. The book La Société de l'Invention, pour une architectonique philosophique de l'âge écologique, published in 2018, is thus the first in a new series of works that will finally build the philosophical relativity for which I was already planning when I met Bernard. That is, that is why I would like today to refer to center certain major aspects of the very special re relationship I have always had with his thought and his work. The most fundamental of those aspects concerns the strictly architectonic question of method in philosophy. And it is this fundamental aspect that the title of my, of my intervention emphasize. We will see that through my critical relationship to Bernard, it is in a sense Derrida's critical relationship to Bernard that is expressed, albeit in a new form. I say Derrida's critical relationship to Bernard and not the other way around. Because my thesis is that what I have been building since 2015 under the name of semantic difference is an archi-reflexive and post-Wittgensteinian radicalization of Derrida's questioning, as it was deeper than Bernard's questioning. I know that Geoffrey Bennington also criticized Bernard for not being at the level of reflexivity of Derrida's questioning. But I totally disagree with Bennington's way of talking about Bernard. There is something about this akin to the contempt that mere followers of one thinker can sometimes display for another thinker. Because Bernard is a true thinker, and no, and no disciple of Derrida can hide this fact. I close this parenthesis. To generally define my relationship to Bernard by way of introduction to my subject, it is useful to go through the confrontation between my critical relationship to Simondon for 30 years and Bernard's critical relationship to Simondon. Simondon constructed an anti-substantialist ontology of individuation, which claimed to be first philosophy, 
but which at the same time claimed to be derived from physical fault sheens. I recalled in chapter six, six of La Société de l'Invention why this point is no longer a necessary and subtle paradox, but a real contradiction. Now, this contradiction can be dissolved if we manage to resolve another difficulty within Simonon's discourse. Because immediately after claiming the status of first philosophy for his genetic ontology, Simondon adds, unfortunately, it is impossible for the human subject to witness his own genesis, because the subject must, must exist in order for him to be able to think. There is indeed a new immediate difficulty here, since the link made by Simondon between the idea of first, philo first philosophy and the idea of witnessing its own genesis this link means that while condemning the inclination of the Eusorian phenomenologists who want to witness their own genesis, Simondon concedes to them that witnessing their own genesis would be the self-knowledge in which a true first philosophy contests. Simondon also intends to propose a form of, of radical reflexivity, since he claims that his genetic ontology is the going beyond the face-to-face -face between the subject, the subject and the object. The, the object of this ontology is the process of individuation. And the knowledge of individuation is itself, he says, individuation of knowledge. But we can clearly see that this reflexivity does not consist in witnessing its own genesis. And since it is unfortunate as Simonon said, that the subject cannot attend its own genesis, then the, the knowledge of individuation that individuates itself in knowledge is a reflexivity by default. I announce it, it is by solving this difficulty that I dissolve in the same gesture the contradiction of a first philosophy which will nevertheless be derived from physical schemes. Indeed, in La Société de l'Invention, the anti-substantialist ontology of individuation is reconstructed as constituting no longer a first problemat problem problematics, but rather one of the three second, second translations of a new first problematics called archi-reflexive semantics, of which two other second translations are philosophy of economic production and philosophy of axiological education. Ontology, for his, for his part, then takes the name of philosophy of ontological information. And its role is to think about the different regimes of individuation in such a way that one can ontologically account for the non-originality of the thinking individual as the new first problematics had already fought semantically whereas the philosophizing individual had thought of himself as made by the sense-making that he individuates. To take account of this finitude ontologically is to leave the simple self-knowledge that is archive-reflexive semantics with its own and radically anti-natural method to now think of any human subject as non-originary because techno-linguistically reconstructed from the non-human animal subject in which language and technique have not yet interpenetrated to make a cumulative history possible. This is a new version, properly evolutionary, of what Simondon called the trans-individual. And the language techniques interface is what I call a constitutive double transcendence. Now, in the first volume of La Technique et le Temps, we already found a refoundation of the Simondonian transindividual from a constitutive transcendence, since artifacts are crutches of the mind or prosthesis in a new meaning of this word. In the first volume of Pensée l'individuation, I insisted on the need to follow Bernard rather than Simondon. Insofar as in 1958, 
Simondon could only benefit from the first works of Le Roi, Le Roi Gourand, without already being able to benefit from the great work Le Geste et la Parole, where the human is for the first time thought, as, uh, uh, thought of as this primate who builds his thinking interiority, interiority thanks to an exteriorization of his memory in the artifact. In, this theory of the fa in his theory of the phases of culture, which had the particularity of wanting to be genetic without being historical, Simondon believed he could make of the technical region pair the fundamental pair which explains the appearance of science on the one, ha on the one hand, ethics on the other. With Le Geste et la Parole, it is rather the technical Technics language duality that provides the basis for an otherwise properly historical process. In Simondon, language was largely absent because it was the paradigm of his structuralist opponents, who did not think of a real genesis of things. Bernard himself had the immense merit of deepening the, the path opened by Le Rougourant in order to resolve certain internal tensions in Simondon's text. In Pensée l'Individuation, I targeted the passage in Simondon where the need for this active artural refundation of the transindividual that Bernard had carried out was felt. However, the Stigrelian refundation of the transindividual no longer took place within a general ontogenesis which will think the physical and the living before thinking the trans individual. This was a first and very serious problem for me. Bernard seemed to me to transform the anthropogenetic field into the first field on the pretext that he was completely revisiting philosophical anthropology through a technogenetic questioning, which since his doctoral thesis was intended to be, to be a type of uh, a transcendental rather than non transcendental. Moreover, the Stigrelian refination of the Simonian trans individual did not consist in transforming the Lorraguranian coordination into a progress, pre progressive interpenetration of language and techniques. Techne was rather thought by Bernard as what would contain within it this artifact that would be language. And this is why Techne was the only constitutive transcendence for the who. The who was the new name of the design in the volume two of La Technique et le Temps. This was the second major problem in my critical relationship to, Bernard, to what Bernard was proposing. Those two major problems are in fact interrelated because the first of the two can be divided into two sub problems one of which is properly architectonic, while the other concerns the question of the famous anthropological break and its necessary going beyond. And the second major problem, which bears on the simple or double nature, nature of constitutive transcendence, relates precisely to this question of the anthropological break. Now, each time, my new problematics of a key reflexive semantics, as it, as it is then translated into a philosophy of ontological information where humans derive from animals by progressive interpenetration of language and techniques, allows us to re reconstruct philosophy after the Derridian deconstruction. And I maintain that at this point, Bernard does not satisfy Derrida's radical questioning. Neither as regards the sub-problem of philosophical ar architectonics, nor as regards the burning question of the anthropological break and its necessary going beyond. beyond. To make this understood, I would like to finish my brief remarks by starting, uh, starting again from the Heideggerian ontological difference, then by recalling how my semantic difference is intended to be more fundamental but also more radically anti-dogmatic, and in this way, a post wittgensteinian hair of the Derridian difference. I will say along the way how there is, in Bernard, what, what we can call a technological difference, 
but whose hey, transcendental character does not deepen what was potentially contained in Derrida's radical questioning. First, the ontological difference in Heidegger is the difference between Sein and Seiende. And through it, Heidegger intends to place himself below all the differences which were posed to the principle of the philosophies of his predecessors. The reflexive depth of this new principal difference is however so difficult to explore that in his niche, Heidegger will reproach Zeinunzeit for having, having still remained dependent of the subject-object relation by reducing the difference between Zayn and Zayende to the difference between Dasein and other beings. In Zayunzeit, being was still fought through Dasein, and Heidegger affirmed at the threshold, threshold of the work that the ontological or existential problem ultimately depends on the ontic and or existential level. Exist yes, existential in French, not existential, but existential. I, sh I showed in chapter five of La Société de l'Invention that Zion site suffers from another limitation, which this time will be a limitation until the end. Because when he thinks of the Buddhist in uh, paragraph 15 to 18 of the insight, Heidegger does not exploit the archi-reflexive archi potential of the idea that appeared in paragra paragraph uh, 13. The idea that knowledge is only one mode within a multimodal being in the world. This idea could have enabled Heidegger to question the multidimensional character of the sense making of each meaning he was manu manipulating, and which is never reducible to the sole dimension of the object of knowledge, which would not constitute the philosophizing individual in his her finitude. But instead of that, that is to say, instead of thinking about his, his own non originality in his relation, relation to manipulated meanings and their multidimensional sense-making, Heidegger, from paragraph 15, reduces the Bedeutsamkeit to a simple structure of reference, structure de renvoi in French, between beings. The concept of difference in Derrida inherits this structure, structure of reference, but perhaps leaving more up open the possibility of an archi-reflexive radicalization as a necessary questioning on the status of the philosophizing individual himself or herself, herself in his or her relation to, to the sense-making of the meanings he or she manipulates. Here I must recall that I named meanings what was named representations since the critique of pure reason. The reason of this substitution is that the notion of representations doesn't enable us to think the multidimensionality of the sense-making of each object of thought, which is irreducible to the sole dimension of the object of knowledge. By posing his concept of difference, Derrida was not content to pose the problem of writing already present in speaking. It was not just a question of going beyond linguistics by thinking of the system of differences that language is as a process of self-differentiation of refer reference. It was also, and therefore, to question our relationship to the presence of things. And it is at this point that my own questioning on the relativity of the simultaneity between the philosophizing individual and the sense-making of the meanings that he or she manipulates could be, could be considered as the post-Wittgensteinian radicalization of a question that is at least potentially present in Derrida. In any, in any case, it is only this second aspect of his questioning that allows Derrida to escape the criticism addressed to him by Bernard, and even to make possible a reciprocal and more fundamental criticism of Bernard's approach. Indeed, 
If Derrida had been content to think of to think of the writing already present in speaking, then one could reduce his thought to the anthropo anthropogenetic question and address the reproach of not thinking more generally of tactic as what makes human. With Bernard, difference becomes a technological difference under the names of défaut d'origine and protéticité. It is in fact the difference to itself from the human already fought by Sartre, who however did not understand that the being who has no essence is a prosthetic being. Bernard and Sloterdijk are the two main thinkers of the beginning of this new century who think about this prostheticity. And with Bernard, who goes into much more depth on this point, it leads, it leads to the theme of tertiary retention. But as I announced, Derrida, by posing the problem of writing, also writes the question of reference and of its own self-differentiation differentiation, differentiation in the system of difference that is language. What therefore constitutes the most fundamental level of his questioning is the properly post heideggerian problem of presence, and therefore of our relation to the sense-making of things that present themselves there in front of us. For Sense-making is precisely what is not there in front of us. Now, once we have understood how this fundamental problem is no longer anthropogenetic, but, but concerns the status of the philosophizing individual himself or herself in his or her relation to the meanings she or he manipulates, we can show that what is required by this, by this fundamental level of questioning has in a second time for consequence at the anthropogenetic level this time, a thought of the human animal, uh, of the human animal, animal as intentionality reconstructed via a progressive interpenetration of techniques and language. This idea of interpenetration of techniques and language is preci precisely what makes it possible to do away with what in Bernard's thought looks like a residue of anthropological cut. Because by making technique what makes the interior interiority of the human possible, Bernard at the same time refused to think of the non-human animal with its language and its technique. And he did not, not think of the process of interpenetration of language and techniques through which Homo gradually emerged. This process differs from what Le Roi Gourand had thought of, uh, had thought of under the name of language technique coordination. And it is also what makes it possible to find a continuity between the non-human animal and the human in accordance with what Derrida requested when he reproached the Western philosophical tradition for not thinking of the being subject of the non-human animal. I come to finish with the new fundamental problematics of which all this is only a secondary, secondary ontological consequence. I said above that Heidegger, after asking the question of the meaning of being, then forgot the question of meaning in favor of that of being. He had certainly understood the limits of the insight and of its anchoring in design, but he had not subjected the question of being to the archie ref reflexive question of the meaning and the re relationship of the philosophizing individual to the sense making of the meanings that he or she manipulates. Yet, the insight paragraph uh, 13, which made knowledge a mode within multimodal being of, in the world, opened up the possibility of thinking, thinking about the multidimensionality of the sense making of each manipulated meaning. To construct this thought is to develop a simple knowledge of oneself as made by sense making, which cannot be reduced to the sole dimension of the object of knowledge. It is therefore to apply to oneself the ambition of a true thought of finitude. 
For it is not enough to assert that the design thought by the philosophizing individual is finite. It is not enough either to dissenter from the point of view of ontological thesis by thinking of the human from a re renewed evolutionary perspective, that is to say, as a technologically recon reconstructed primate. It is thus also necessary and initially to pose a new first problematics which is not which which is not yet ontological but semantic, and in which the philosophizing individual tries to determine the radically anti-natural method which will allow him or her to thwart the trap of the human intentionality as objectivizing intentionality for sense making. Because the philosophizing individual, by equating the many manipulated meanings with their reference reduces their sense making to the sole dimension of the object of knowledge. Whereas, whereas this sense making is multidimensional, that is to say, irreducible to the object. And it constitutes the philosophizing individual himself or herself, herself as non originary subject. We therefore need to invent a methodological decentering in our relationship to the sense making of the meanings that we manipulate in order to open ourselves, ourselves to a new type of principal difference, the semantic difference, which is the difference between, between the multidimensional sense making and each of its own dimensions. Such a difference is no longer absolute, but rel relative. relative. And this relativity, insofar as it proceeds from an archi reflectivity, must, must make possible what I call philosophical relativity. What then is Bernard's major contribution if it is not a contribution, a contribution concerning the method in philosophy and therefore the philosophical architectonics proper? Bernard's my major contribution is, first of all, the possibility of a historical psychosociology of the death after the Freudian psychology of the death. And this is why in chapter three of La Société de l'Invention, I use Bernard's work as I have used that, that of Hartmut Rosa in chapter four. Bernard and Rosa are essential beyond Freud and Marx to think of our time as the catastrophic result of a Western and capitalist historical process. But another possible contribution exists in Bernard's fault, and it is with this contribution that I wish I wish to dialogue in my future critique de la raison désirante. Because Bernard asked, asked himself the question of law and of its refundation in the ecological age. And he proposed to think of negantropy as value of value. Now, even if for my part as I separate the law from any ethical or more generally axiological question, I nevertheless refund the law on an economic normativity, which is that of the suffering needs, of which it is a question of considering the greatest possible compatibility on the scale of the biosphere. And in this, the question of negentropy is not foreign to my project. Thank you for your attention.